at first glance, carbon pricing mechanisms can seem quite complicated. But at their centre, they're simply based on creating a disincentive to emit greenhouse gases. To break this down, let's look at a simple waste analogy. Imagine your household generates 10 kilograms of garbage every week. The government decides to introduce a waste levy and now you have to pay $10 for each kilogram of waste. That's $100 per week. What will your response be? Well, now that every kilogram of garbage is costing your household money, it's in your best interest to avoid that cost by reducing the amount of waste you generate. In light of this new policy, adopting environmentally sustainable practices, such as recycling, is now beneficial to your household. Carbon pricing policies are based on this same principle. They encourage climate change mitigation by imposing a financial charge on greenhouse gas emissions. This charge, called a carbon price, is the amount that must be paid for the right to emit one tonne of carbon dioxide equivalents into the atmosphere. Imposing a carbon price creates a disincentive for companies to emit greenhouse gases. In doing so, this policy encourages the adoption of low carbon technologies by making higher polluting options more expensive. Carbon pricing policies are generally categorised into two main mechanisms. First, there are carbon taxes. In this case, the government sets a fixed price for every tonne of greenhouse gases emitted, for example, $20 per tonne of CO2e. Then there's emissions trading schemes. Instead of setting the price of carbon, the government caps the quantity of greenhouse gases that can be emitted by participating companies. For example, this cap might be 500 million tonnes of CO2e. This leaves the market to determine the price of carbon pollution, which fluctuates the same way that other market-traded commodity prices do. Carbon taxes are considered price-based policies. They set a discrete cost that must be paid to the government for every tonne of CO2e that companies emit into the atmosphere. Carbon taxes are usually levied based on fuel type. For example, since 1991, Norway has imposed a carbon tax of around 50 US dollars per tonne of emissions from gasoline, while the carbon tax on heavy fuel oils is much less. Other countries that have introduced carbon taxes include Denmark, Finland, Costa Rica and Canada. Unlike the price-based carbon tax, emissions trading schemes, or ETSs, are considered a quantity-based mechanism. This policy is also commonly known as a cap and trade scheme and has been implemented under climate policies in Europe, the United States, China and many other parts of the world. Under an ETS, the regulatory authority sets a limit on the maximum amount of greenhouse gases that may be emitted by a group of industry sectors in an economy. This limit is known as the emissions cap or just simply the cap. The authority issues one allowance certificate for every tonne of CO2e permitted under the ETS cap. Allowances are allocated to liable companies by the government, either freely or via an auction process based on a proportion of the company's annual emissions. Critically, these liable companies must obtain one allowance certificate for each tonne of CO2e that they emit. And if they don't, they face hefty fines for every tonne that they do not have an allowance for. Under an ETS, some companies will not have enough allowances to cover their entire carbon footprint. We refer to this as being short in allowances. These companies have the option of reducing their emissions to avoid the fine, or purchasing allowances from a company that has too many. Logically, a company will pursue the lowest cost option, which is evaluated on the basis of dollars per tonne of CO2e. Let's say a company has the option to upgrade its vehicle fleet at a cost of $250,000, thus reducing its emissions by 10,000 tonnes. This would cost the company $25 per tonne of avoided CO2e. If the company had an alternative option to buy allowances from the carbon market for, say, $20 per tonne, then the company will rationally choose to buy allowances instead of upgrading its vehicle fleet. However, if allowances cost $30 per tonne of CO2e, then reducing the company's emissions 
at $25 per tonne is clearly the better option. So, in summary, if it is less costly for a company to reduce their emissions than to buy allowances, they will do so, and vice versa. It's possible for a company to end up with excess allowances if it buys too many or reduces its emissions below its obligation. These excess allowances can then be banked for future use or sold in an open market to a firm that finds it more difficult, that is costly, to reduce emissions. Importantly, the ETS cap declines annually in line with the nation's emissions reduction targets. This, of course, means that each year there are fewer and fewer allowance certificates available in the market, increasing the pressure on companies to reduce their emissions. Now, this shrinking cap occurs despite increases and decreases in gross domestic product. For example, a 5% reduction by 2020 on 2000 levels means the number of available ETS allowances will be lower by 5% by the end of the scheme, even though GDP has risen. If the scheme is well designed, total emissions should also lower over this period. Under an ETS, the price that companies pay for allowances is dictated by market supply and demand. When the economy's total emissions go up, there's an overall scarcity of allowances, as the availability of these are limited by the cap. This results in increased competition for allowances, which leads to a higher carbon price. This price provides a continuous incentive for companies to reduce emissions and innovate, as they can save money by avoiding the cost of buying allowances. When total emissions go down, the carbon price should theoretically decrease as the demand for allowances also falls. This market-driven price acts as a buffer for companies in times of economic downturn. Governments can use additional design features to ensure some degree of certainty in the carbon price. For example, they can set a minimum and a maximum auction price for allowances, which is the so-called price collar. In summary, Carbon pricing policies impose a cost on carbon pollution to encourage polluters to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases they emit. Similar to how households might respond to a waste levy, we can see that companies, when faced with a price on carbon, will respond by finding the lowest cost pathway to compliance. In short, if it is less costly for a company to reduce their emissions than to pay the carbon price, they will do so.